My pleasure to be here with you today at Media Democracy Day. My name is Irene Lansinger. Uh, I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the BC Federation of Labour. I come from the Teachers Union. That was my union for many years and still is. Still on leave from Vancouver School Board in case the kind of labour gig falls through. Um, I'm happy to have uh, be asked to moderate this panel. We have a wonderful panel. I'm really looking forward to what they have to say about work in the communications industry. I'm going to introduce them and then I'm going to tell you uh, the three questions we pose to them, which is kind of loose structure uh, for their talk. Uh, you know, they'll, uh, they will all have a lot of experience uh, in the industry, so um, whatever they say is fine with me, but I will tell you the three questions that we pose to them. So, uh, right next to me here is Enda Brophy. He's an assistant professor in the School of Communications at Simon Fraser University. His research examines labor and labor organizing in the media, communications industries, social movements, and the political economy of the contemporary university. He's working on a very big research project uh, right now, which I know the other two panelists are quite interested in, uh, funded by Shirk, and he's working with a number of other people on a project called Flexible Workforces Respond to the Creative Economy, the Recomposition of Labor Politics in an Age of Precarity. Uh, so I know that he's going to tell us a bit about that, and we're all looking forward to it. Uh, next to him, you may recognize Catherine Gretzinger. She's an instru a lead instructor in integrated journalism at the UBC Graduate School of Journalism. She also coordinates the school internship program. She has a passion for audio storytelling in current affairs, news, and documentary production. She began her career as a CBC journalist and has worked there for 26 years uh, in various capacities, from writer, broadcaster, pro producer, to host, and she continues to work uh, with the CBC. On the end is Mark Cameron. He's presently a national staff rep for the Communications, Energy, and Paper Workers Union of Canada. But prior to this, Mark uh, spent a quarter of a century as a broadcast television news editor. He's combined that with a, a decade of union activism and leadership. His experience gives him a unique perspective on regulations and labor relations within the communications industry. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. So we asked them to address uh, these three questions. Does working in the communications and creative industries fit the traditional definition of labor? What changes have occurred in communications labor in the past 20 years? Examples may include international outsourcing, internships, and freelancing. Are these positive or negative developments for workers? Okay, so without further ado, we're going to start with Enda, and then the other two are going to jump in. Okay, thank you uh, very much. <clears throat> And uh, thank you for, for coming. Uh, I think it'd be uh, remiss of me on a on a panel that deals with labor uh, to not begin by pointing out that the uh, teaching and support staff union and QB three 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 eight at Simon Fraser University are currently involved in escalating job action, and the picket lines are currently up in front of SFU's uh, Harbor Center campus today and tomorrow and that they will be up in front of all three campuses on Wednesday, and I would uh, encourage you to go down there and show your support for those workers. I also want to thank the many organizers and uh, volunteers uh, for whose labor helps put this event together. Uh, Media Democracy Day, now Media Democracy Days, uh, is such an important project for those of us who uh, think of the media as more than just a strategic sector for economic growth. I really love the way that this event uh, seeks to bring together both researchers and uh, labor activists and media uh, activists. And, and I also think it's a very encouraging sign that Media Democracy Day has begun to make space for a discussion of labor and working conditions in the media. Researchers in critical media studies, I think, have traditionally focused the overwhelming amount of their attention on uh, media ownership and concentration as the biggest problems facing those who aim for more of a democratic media. Now, I think without wanting to take anything away from those who look at media ownership and concentration, what I want to do today is I want to make the case that the goal of democratizing the media 
may be better served by democratizing the workplaces and the labor that produces the media. In other words, organizing the media industries from below and increasing the power of workers in these sectors might just be a more effective route to media democratization than demanding that we have six multimedia conglomerates as opposed to five or to four or to three. And so this project of media democratization from below by the media workers that produce value in the sector is the one that I'm going to spend some time discussing today. Now first of all, however, why would we want to democratize work in the creative industries? Some might ask. After all, as uh, the University of Toronto uh, business guru Richard Florida and his followers point out, working in creative sectors such as the arts, media, fashion, telecommunications, gaming, and new media is highly sought after work. The idea of the so-called creative industries as an ethical route to job creation and economic growth has become so dominant in recent years that it's been eagerly promoted by everyone from local municipalities all the way up to the United Nations, which produced a, a very large study in 2008, or published a large study in 2008, dedicated to the promise of the creative economy as a way to work our, work our way out of the financial crisis that we're in. And so while I think it's really important to support work and workers in these industries by supporting these industries, I also think we need to be really wary of creative industries discourse. Because the ubiquitous picture that it gives us is of hip, empowered workers engaged in work that they're passionate about uh, in return for big bucks. You know, maybe working out of a coffee shop or a converted loft or something like that. And in order to bring this picture down to earth, I think we need to first take a step back. We need to get a more realistic understanding of the workforce in the creative industries that we never get to see. Tyler Morgenstern was talking earlier today about visibility and invisibility. And I think that uh, we need to consider the, the invisible workforce in the creative industries before we consider the visible one. These are the workers that don't appear in Richard Florida's books. So critical researchers and labor activists have pointed towards the growth of a global, interlinked, and highly exploited labor force required to produce the hardware, the software, and the services without which the creative industries just could not run. We would have no creative industries. Consider the work into what we could argue is the most sacred consumer item of the creative economy, the iPhone. First, miners in the Democratic Republic of Congo, many of them children, must dig a mineral called coltan out of the earth to arm militias so that it can be included in handsets. Then, in India or Mexico, but especially in China, a labor force of hundreds of thousands is put to work assembling hardware at the Foxconn factory, which has been marked by a spate of suicides and more recently a riot over labor conditions. Finally, when the technology gets discarded at the end of its life cycle, entire villages of workers in China, Ghana, or other developing countries have to uh, scavenge through mountains of highly toxic e-waste, disassembling the technology for valuable metals. So this is the first point that I want to make about working in the communication and creative industries, that we need to be cognizant of the highly racialized, 
highly gendered and mostly invisible labor that goes into making the creative economy possible. But let's move on to the creative workers that Richard Florida actually discusses. For these people, including for many of you in the audience today, the experience of working in the creative industries is not nearly as hellish a one as we, uh, as for the uh, people that I just mentioned. However, and this is the second point that I want to make, the balance of power between them and their employers has shifted decisively towards the latter in the last 20 or 30 years. That is, the balance of power has shifted in the creative industries towards employers dramatically in the last 20 or 30 years. In the telecommunications industry, we, for example, we've witnessed an all-out attack on trade unions by convergent media companies in recent decades, meaning that a stable, unionized job with benefits where someone might even hope to retire at some point, imagine, uh, is increasingly now a thing of the past. Locally, we don't have to look further than TELUS uh, to see how this attack on unions has played out. Elsewhere, in some of the more glamorous sectors of the creative industry, such as fashion and media, employers are now making unprecedented demands of their workforce. Most students in my communication courses accept it as a given that they will have to go undergo a series of internships in order to even have a shot at the job of their dreams. Internships otherwise known as working for free. And there are a series of problems with unpaid and low paid internships. The creative industries are actually particularly egregious offenders in this area. But the two most important issues are that first they assume that somehow because somebody is young they don't deserve to get paid for the work that they do, uh, which I would argue is quite ancient. And secondly, they seriously, to my opinion, uh, threaten the composition of those industries going forward. What does it mean when the main gatekeeping role the main institution by which you can access an industry is actually rather arguably limited to those who can afford to work for free. What does that mean for the composition of that workforce going forward? In fact, the problem of free labor is actually endemic in the creative industry. Journalists, how can you tell us bit about this, I guess. Uh, most notably through sites like Huffington Post are now increasingly expected to work for exposure, as if that pays the rent. And freelance work in new media, which is so celebrated by Richard Florida, often actually means that one lives a terminally precarious existence, without access to adequate welfare supports, during periods of unemployment. In fact, while the creative industries uh, increasingly rely on part-time contract, temporary work, or freelance arrangements, what remains of our social safety nets are still somehow designed according to an increasingly outdated norm of a full-time, stable employment relationship. That's increasingly not the norm in our economy. One of the most extreme examples of the outsourced work that sustains Web 2.0, for example, is Amazon.com's Mechanical Turk. This is a company that crowdsources tiny pieces of rote work to an online workforce making somewhere around $1.50 an hour on average, enjoying no worker protections and deriving no benefit. Add to this brew uh, the austerity measures that are currently ravaging the cultural sectors of developed countries across the world, including our own, and it becomes clear that for those hoping to democratize the media,